Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. This is Esther uh, chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the middle of the city and cried loudly and bitterly. He went only as far as the king's gate, since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. There was great mourning among the Jewish people in every province where the king's command and edict had reached. They fasted, wept, and lamented, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome with fear. She sent clothes for Mordecai to wear so that he would take off his sackcloth, but he did not accept them. Esther summoned Hasak, one of the king's eunuchs who attended her, and dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what he was doing and why. So Hasak went out to Mordecai's in the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened, as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, ordering their destruction, so that Hathak might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and command her to approach the king, implore his favor, and plead with him personally for her people. Hathak came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther. Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to tell Mordecai, all the royal officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard and who has not been summoned, the death penalty, unless the king extends the golden scepter, allowing that person to live. And I have not been summoned to appear before the king for this last 30 days. Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king even if it is against the law. If I perish... I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, Esther is an interesting book of the Bible because it is a book that never mentions God directly. I don't know if you knew that, but it's a book that uh, implies the presence and the providence of God. And we have this uh, incredible woman named Esther that we're going to be looking at today in Esther chapter 4. And this is week three of a series called Hungry for God. And what we're doing in this series is we're preparing ourselves for a season of prayer and fasting that we're joining with churches around the city of Houston in an initiative called Awaken Houston. And what we're challenging people to do is that every one of us would consider in the month of February, how might we do what is almost unthinkable in the town that is known not for great landmarks, not for great topography, not for mountains. It's known for food. We live in the land of Tex-Mex, of, of Thai of every ethnic food you can imagine, plus Texas, the land of steaks and potatoes, right? And yet here we are talking about fasting in prayer. 
to consider how we might make space in our lives and that we might grow hungry for God, for him to move. And so what we're doing is we're looking at these moments in scripture where there was a call for prayer and fasting. And we heard that in the passage today that they're, they're calling for prayer and fasting, that Mordecai, he drops down at the king's gate and he's, he's in the sackcloth, right? He's in ash and he's fasting and he's praying. And Esther, she says, call the people together, right? Have them fast and pray because they needed God to move in power. And we're asking God to do the same thing in our city in this Awaken Houston uh, initiative. And today we're talking about um, relinquishing. That's the, the title of, um, of the message today is to relinquish. And I, I just want to tell you what that means because you probably don't use that word every day in your, in your regular uh, talking. To relinquish means to leave behind to give up, release, or to yield, right? It's just to kind of let something go, to relinquish it. And we have this woman, Esther, in the story who is the beauty queen. She was the fairest in the land. If, if you know the story of Esther, uh, the, the king, King Xerxes, uh, at that time, the Persian ruler, uh, his queen, Vashti, had denied coming out. So he had called her and she said, no thanks. And so he calls together his buddies and they're like, what are we going to do? The queen's not going to, you know, obey me. And they talked him into deposing her and holding bachelor season one. Okay. That's what happened. They issue this royal edict. They call out all the beautiful young ladies from the land. They put together this group, and he just kind of one by one has his date with every one of them, and at the end, he picks one, and Esther is the winner. She is the winner of Bachelor Season 1. She is the fairest in the land. And before she could ever see him, she spent a year of preparation of, like, oils and uh, anointing and different things to prepare her beauty for a, an entire year. Now imagine that. Imagine, ladies, imagine just your whole year was given to being pampered, right? Just developing your beauty for an entire year. That's what she did. So we have this beauty queen who is brought with this incredible uh, challenge before her. Her people are going to be annihilated. She's got to do something about it. And, and the, the question that I want us to consider today is, what could transform someone from being self-involved, insulated from the pain of the world, and only about themselves, to postured for kingdom risk for the good of others? We're just asking for a friend, right? <laughs> just asking for a friend. How... how how could someone go from being self-involved, insulated from the pain of the world, and only about themselves, to being postured for kingdom risk for the good of others? What would it take for us to be transformed? And I just want to let the passage speak to us, just let it teach us. And the invitation is for us just to relinquish our lives. It's just to, to let our lives go at the feet of Jesus and say, we're yours. That's, that's the invitation today. So I, I want us to look at this story and starting back in, in uh, verse one of chapter four, we see that Mordecai learns of this, this terrible edict that has come about from Haman. Haman was one of the royal advisors. Haman was an, an, an anti-Semite. Mordecai was a Jewish man who was uh, Esther's cousin that raised her. And so Mordecai is hearing about Haman's plot, and he's letting Esther know what's going to happen to the people. And here's what it says. When, when Mordecai learned all that had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sack, sackcloth and ashes, went into the middle of the city and cried loudly and bitterly. I mean, he is just making noise about this issue. He went only as far as the king's gate since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. 
There was great mourning among the Jewish people in every province where the king's command and edict came. They fasted, wept, and lamented, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4, Esther gets the word. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome with fear. She sent clothes for Mordecai to wear so that he would take off his sackcloth, but he did not accept them. So here we have Mordecai, and he is, you know, he's wailing. He's, he's just crying out loud in the middle of the city at the king's gate, and he's making noise about this issue. And what he does is he awakens Esther to the distress. See, the, the first thing, step in us moving from self-involved, insulated, kind of, you know, about ourselves to postured for kingdom purpose is that we have to stop side-stepping distress. Before the service started, um, I asked Farrell, what was it that awakened you to the needs in Nicaragua? And he said, I I went there and I saw 200 kids, like age six and younger, on the streets, huffing glue to deal with their hunger pains. Farrell's background was a trucking, he was in the trucking business, right? In the trucking business. And so he went from this life in the trucking business to, I'm going to go do something about it. It's like there was something that awakened him to the needs where he couldn't sidestep the distress any longer. We, uh, last week, it had Martin Luther King Jr., uh, uh, the, the holiday, and, and he's someone who made all this noise around injustice that literally changed our nation. And we can be insulated by our comforts, Right? We have, we have algorithms on our social media that feeds us things that are of the most interest to us, right? And it's almost like we're being insulated from the other people out there and from the other issues out there in the world. And our natural response, if we're honest, to the distress of the world is that we want to figure out how we can silence it as quickly as possible so that it doesn't disturb us anymore, we, we, we want quick and painless solutions. And the reality is that in this blessed you know, nation that we live in, in a blessed town where we have an abundance of things, that it's, it's really easy for us to sidestep distress, to use the, the money or the position or the pace to sort of keep ourselves away from the distresses around us. And then we have this moment where Esther decides to open her eyes to the problem, right? She, she reaches out to Mordecai in verse 5. It says this, Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who attended her, and dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what he was doing and why. So Hathak went out to meet Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of the Jews. Esther is awakened, and I think there's, there's something in us that, that needs to be awakened to the distresses around us. The second step for us in the process is what Esther does, and it's this, that we count the cost. She, she does this wise work of counting the cost as she has learned about the plight of her people and what it will cost her to be involved. And here's what it says. Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to tell Mordecai, all the royal officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in their inner courtyard and who has not been summoned the death penalty. She's counting the cost. Here's what it's going to take. Like if I'm, if I'm going to step into this distress, if I'm going to do something about it, I need to be really honest about what it's going to cost me. She said, I've not been summoned to appear before the king for the last 
30 days. By the way, uh, kings at that time, like monogamy was not a thing. Okay, so the, the fact that she was queen and had not been summoned for 30 days did not mean that the king was lonely and was looking forward to seeing her. And so she knew, like, this is a great cost to me. There, there is a potential that he does to me what he did to his previous queen, which is get rid of her. I could be killed for this. And so she reports her response to Mordecai. She counts the cost. And I think the reality is that we have to avoid rosy optimism when it comes to the distresses of our world. Right? It's, it's so easy when we hear, you know, someone come in and talk about the, um, you know, distress of human trafficking, or if your heart's been moved towards foster care, towards adoption, or towards uh, another type of, of ministry or mission or organization. A lot of times there's something in this that's like, oh, wow, let's, you know, let's, let's go. But there's not that count costing thing in, in, in people who have, stepped into those kinds of callings without counting the cost will tell you like, it's hard, right? There's, there's so much in there. There has to be a, 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 a reorienting of our lives towards the, the needs and the real cost of stepping into these distresses. I was reading this week in uh, my personal reading, just Luke chapter 14, and, and Jesus is having like, all these multitudes are traveling with him. It's like what we call the rock star phase of his ministry. It's all these people love Jesus and they want to be around him. And so he's with his disciples, but there's this whole crew. I don't know how many people that are traveling with him at this time. And uh, there's a moment where Jesus looks at them, right? And, and he, he says some pretty hard things. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow, that's a great way to kill a crowd, Jesus. He gives two examples. One, building a tower without first counting the cost. The second example was a king who would wage a war without first considering his odds of winning the war. If he had enough troops, if, it, if he had enough supplies. And he's telling them, look, I want you to follow me, but if you're going to follow me, I want you to count the cost. So we have to stop sidestepping the distress and we have to count the cost just as Esther, Esther did. And the third thing is this. We have to consider the alternative. Esther does this starting in verse 12. Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, don't think you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you're in the king's palace. Meaning, look, this isn't just about those people out there that you're insulated from because of this life in the palace that you're enjoying. Look, this is going to affect you too. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, meaning this, look, Esther, God's going to get this thing done, but he's positioned you to be a key player in this. Don't miss the opportunity. That's what he's telling her. Like, God's going to get it done, but he's positioned you. Don't miss this opportunity. Consider the alternative. It's, it's like a train on a track. It's like these purposes of God are going to get completed. God knows how to get the job done. Nothing will stop his kingdom purposes. But you and I, we're standing on the platform and the train is coming by. And the opportunity for us is like, will we join in? Will we step into what God is doing? Will we get on to his train, his sovereign purposes? And we have this incredible moment. It's the, it's the, the verse that we quote from Esther. And here's what it says. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Um, probably all of us have some stories in our life where we got invited to do something, right? 
Maybe your family's doing something, your friends are doing something. You get invited to go. And then, you know, you, whatever, you're like, I'm not going to go. I'm deciding not to go. And then you, you get all the, like, text messages with the pictures of all the stuff you missed out on, right? And they're like, oh, we saw a celebrity, and we took a picture of them. And you're like, oh, my, you know, it's like, whatever. Like, you missed out on this great moment. And, and that's what he's saying. He's like, look, there, there's something happening here that God's doing. Don't miss this. Like, don't miss this opportunity. It's like FOMO, Right? Fear of missing out. Like, I think we need some godly FOMO, some kingdom FOMO of like, I don't want to miss out on what God's doing in the world. God's positioned you wherever you are, whatever you do, whatever work you do, if you stay home with your kids, if you, whatever industry you work in, whatever friends you hang out with, whatever people you see regularly, God has positioned you for a purpose. And he wants to use you. And consider, what if you could actually be used by him to do something amazing? I I was listening to a friend, and he was talking about, um, what if you had lunch with future you? So imagine um, you have a lunch scheduled on your on your calendar you you don't even you don't know who it is you're just going to go show up at this restaurant you show up to the restaurant you sit down and it's you from like 800 years in the future and just imagine so like on the other side of death the the resurrected in eternity you comes back and talks to you today like what do you think that person would tell you you 800 years from now like what would you tell yourself today here's what he said. He goes, I think future me would say, you were really, really, really concerned about a lot of things that don't really matter. And you were not concerned enough about the things that really do matter. Consider the alternative. God's positioned us for his purposes wherever we are, and he wants to use us. So we have the stop sidestepping distress. We have to count the cost. We have to consider the alternative. But lastly is what Esther does in verse 15. Here's what she says. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. That's what she says, fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king. And even if it is against the law, if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai did everything Esther had commanded him. She takes a prayerful plunge. She just dives right in. If I perish, I perish. She's going to go for it, right? She's going to step out in faith and take this prayerful plunge. The the pampered beauty queen makes a surprising change, risking her life for the good of others to, to take a kingdom risk. And just notice the role that communal fasting plays. And it's like this. It's like a dress rehearsal. She's, she's going to relinquish food and drink and pray to prepare her for relinquishing her life for what God is calling her to do. I think it's really, really important in a story that never, ever mentions the name of God that we don't miss Jesus in the story. He didn't sidestep your distress. Jesus, sent by the Father, steps into our mess of humanity. He comes in the flesh for us that we could see him. He he knows it's going to cost him dearly. He considered the alternative, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's there and he's got his friends and he's like, let's pray together. Come on, guys. And they all fall asleep. And he cries out to the Father and he says, 
not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, he, he, he doesn't sidestep. He, he knows the cost. He steps in. He, he gathers the people to pray. He willingly relinquishes his life in love for our benefit. And here's the thing. When you understand that Jesus did that, not just for people out there, but for your own heart, when that lands on you, when you understand that Jesus did that for you, there's something that changes in us, that that shifts in us, where we are willing to say, not my will, but yours be done. I relinquish my life to you. Friends, um, there's so many things, so many things to grip our hearts. There's so many um, incredible ministries. There's the lostness of our community. There are people, um, I heard a story this week of, of a family here in our community that is going back and forth to Miami and they are, um, the wife is shaving her head. They're putting on white clothing and they are offering animal sacrifices to Santeria because they just want their child to be better. We, we, we have people crying out for spiritual solutions to things that they, they don't even know what to do with. There's a, there's a need. There's a need in our community. In a five-mile radius where there's 200,000 people, in 120,000 of those people are unclaimed by any religious group of any kind. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Right? There, there are ministries, like we got to hear about today, Hope Project, where, where we can make a difference. And the question is, God, what do you want me to do? How are you positioning me? I'm willing to count the cost and to relinquish my life to you because Jesus has already done it for me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rind-church.org.